Good morning, everybody. Um, we just concluded, members of my cabinet, um, with the members of the council, our monthly mayor council breakfast. This was our first such breakfast since the council uh, returned uh, from recess. Uh, I made some introductions uh, related to uh, new appointees. Uh, we also had briefings on significant uh, air question areas. Um, of initiatives we're working on. And so we're happy to answer any questions. Rosen, yes, sure. How confident are you today that everyone is accounted for, that the list you're working on is an actual, adequate, accurate list? Well, we have, um, and we believe, uh, have made contact with all of the tenants and cross-checked the list. Um, that we have in our efforts. Now, we, we never stopped reaching out uh, to the tenants um, from the time they, that they were at Greenleaf uh, until they were placed in hotels. Uh, we actually made from our conference room yesterday uh, some final contacts of people that DHS had not been in touch with, uh, and we were able to reach them yesterday. So when you say there were people that DHS had not been in contact with, who is that? How many people are we talking about? Where, where were those people? Um, it varied, uh, and so in, as you might uh, know, uh, a lot of the contact phone numbers that we had were for Arthur Capper. Um, so it was a matter of tracking down phone numbers in some cases. So was there was there actually a time when there was more than the gentleman who was discovered in his room who were actually unaccounted for? Was the universe larger than just this one person? Uh, no. So when you say unaccounted for, uh, our um, our reliance on the property manager list and their assurance that every person had been relied on made up the universe of people that we said were accounted for. From that point, we, the government, reached out to each person to connect them with services. Um, and through Monday, there were, uh, I, I don't remember the exact number, but there were a number of people that we hadn't made direct contact with. Um, we believe that we finished that process midday on Monday. Uh, and those units were also the first units uh, searched uh, when Fire and EMS and the building engineer went into the building. Um, I believe, uh, I don't know the answer to that, but I've got to say yes. Yesterday, um, we were there with the building owner um, who hired the engineer, and I know that the building owner went in with fire and EMS personnel. I'm not sure how the system works, but is, does the city have any say on who owns the building or who manages the building? I don't, I will have to have our housing uh, folks answer that question in some detail. As you probably, it sounds like you're familiar, this was part of a um, large uh, redevelopment, I think 2007, 2008. All of the tenants are public housing um, tenants, uh, but the building is privately owned and managed. So just on the, on the issue of K2, can you quickly talk about what your legislation would do, what the changes would do, and also more practically speaking, like what are we looking at here? I mean, are these stores that are selling them like they did in the past? Is DCR gonna have to go out and find more people? You know, how's this stuff getting out to the, the people who are using it? Well, that is a complicated uh, question. Um, and so I think to start the answer is they're getting it in stores, but we think there is a fair level of street dealing uh, and a very cheap product that is very dangerous. Uh, and so sometimes people in the community think of this as synthetic drugs. For a long time, we had to um, fight the impression that it was synthetic marijuana. And most people know that marijuana is, is doesn't produce the type of um, outcomes that we've seen with K2. Uh, so this is not marijuana. The effects are very different, and they can be uh, deadly. Uh, so who's going to talk about the legislation specifically? Um, and, and basically, I'll start. Um, MPD needs this tool um, because the substance that changes frequently uh, has to be defined in the law as a prohibited substance. Uh, and so what this legislation, which was in effect um, on an emergency basis, but I think expired earlier. Um, so we're moving the emergency to put that back uh, in effect. And there may be some updates to it. 
So uh, the mayor is the mayor is right. The, operationally, this is going to make it a lot easier on the uh, enforcement end of this. Uh, I was at a meeting last night, and uh, there is a suggestion that sometimes uh, this is being sold out of some of the local businesses. Uh, so one of the things we're asking the community, if they know of a business, you got to let uh, law enforcement know about it. We can still take uh, police action. I think with the with, with the mayor's legislation, it's going to make it that much more easy for us. Chief, can I go back, um, Mayor, can I go back to Arthur Cavern? Do you know if the, if the management company or the owner of that property owns or operates any other properties that have D.C. residents, public housing? Of course, residents? they're a big provider. So I don't I don't know about public housing residents, really? but I would assume so. Um, and I think you uh, were there for the briefing uh, where we uh, reviewed on a preliminary basis uh, what we know about the building construction uh, and inspections, both from the building owner, what we know about DCRA complaints uh, and inspections, uh, and what we know about fire and EMS uh, inspections. And the other thing that is very important to us at this stage uh, is that as we move people into permanent housing, that those units are also inspected. Um, so that is what our kind of housing task force, who is trying to identify vacant units, um, the housing authority moved uh, board action yesterday, which will allow these residents uh, to uh, have priority consideration. Uh, and we are working on a plan that DCRA and housing uh, will be able to inspect those units. Um, so our hope uh, is that we don't have um, elderly, frail seniors who've lost everything in temporary housing for too long, but we know this is a long process. What is your confidence in this company, this owner, that clearly has more residents, more properties in the building, to, to ensure that something like this doesn't happen again, and, they, and that they are working for, from an updated... Well, I think it's safe to say, Mark, that uh, in our investigation and our after action report that we'll have recommended changes for our housing providers uh, and recommended changes for, our, for, for us as government agencies. And then can you tell me, were you or is anybody in the government made aware prior to the actual physical discovery of the, of the survivor in the building, were you made aware before that that the initial list that, that you were given that said everybody was accounted for was actually inadequate? No. Nobody in the, in the D.C. government We We learned um, when the gentleman was contacted by the, the structural engineers. Keep in mind, I think you know, um, that the building uh, became very unsafe on the night of the fire. Uh, and the determination was that it was structurally unfit for people. Uh, and we weren't looking for anybody. So nobody except the structural engineers, as we reported on Friday, were in the building over the weekend. Um, and even they, I don't think they were able to do the door-to-door -door searches um, until Monday. Chief, can you tell us what goes on today at the site? Yesterday we had the uh, dogs in and looking uh, through, the, through the building. Today we will have the dogs back in. They started early this morning and we will do a, a couple of searches. They'll do one search that allows them to go through the whole area that's considered safe. Then the building, uh, the structural engineer will do some uh, work on the building to stabilize some areas that we haven't been in and we'll go back in and do another search with the dogs. And are the dogs, and I don't know, did, are the dogs cadaver dogs looking for recovery, or are the dogs able to spot signs of life? So the initial dogs yesterday were, uh, were live dogs. They'll go back in one more time today, then we'll take the cadaver dogs in after we do the, the remove. And then can I ask you, if the building is deemed unsafe and needs to just come down and, and nobody can go back into it, what does that do to your ability to investigate and determine the cause of the fire? That, well, that impacts our ability because you have so many dangerous pieces in there to be able to take a look at what's going on. So we were unable to, the ideal what the building, what the structural engineer was doing yesterday was uh, we had our, our fire investigators out there. They were going to, once they thought they had to stabilize, go in and take a look where the parts had fallen down to see if they could look at burn patterns to make that determination. Again, it's all based on um, being able to do this in a safe environment. And why does the the owner have a private engineer going in rather than the city sending in a city engineer to make these determinations, or both being done? So we've, uh, we, had, we had control of the building until Friday uh, when it was determined that the building was unsafe and so we made a determination. Friday we had the dogs there and we also had our fire investigators there. Uh, 
we were, we were told that the building was unsafe and uh, we weren't going to be able to get in there. So we, we moved away and returned the building to the owner and that's why they brought in their people. Let me make a, a, a last comment um, about how important it is that this search um, continues to happen. Um, because while we have made contact with tenants, we, it, there could always be a guest, a worker, or somebody um, that is not associated with the unit that we're unsure about. Uh, we had that experience when there was a, a big fire on Peabody Street some years ago. Somebody not on the lease um, was in the unit, uh, and that, that can happen. Um, and so it is very important uh, still that um, this, this search is completed. Mayor, how's your homicides that surpassed uh, last year's count? How's your demonstration? Uh, I would say that we, just like um, any crime emergency, any time we see a spike in crime, uh, we uh, attack it from every single way. Um, from legislative, if the chief tells me he, there's a tool um, that he needs, then we put that tool in place. We work with our colleagues on the council to do exactly that. Uh, if we find uh, that there are particular hot spots, um, as I think that we're finding with K2, uh, we flood that area with the resources um, that it needs as well. Uh, we also ask the community to help us with information when they know it's a crime, uh, and we ask prosecutors and courts to hold dangerous people uh, and work very hard on their prosecution so that we can ensure that justice is served. Uh, the chief gave me a briefing on uh, what happened over the weekend, uh, which was dramatic outrageous and it happened uh, in different places across the city, all non-random acts, all people likely who knew each other, uh, all most people who have been involved with the criminal justice system uh, and all having access, I, I think in this case, to illegal guns. So we know the ingredients of how um, crime can become combustible. And so we're persistent uh, and strategic in addressing all of those things. But all of the parts have to work together. Lastly, uh, I will say that's kind of the law enforcement end of things. We never uh, take our foot off the pedal when it comes to opportunity. Uh, we finish finished this summer um, a 1,000 opportunities initiative um, that served our DIM GO uh, neighborhoods and uh, we were able to connect over 1,000 people to jobs and training opportunities. So some of these crimes are opportunity related. Some of them uh, are people who have decided uh, that they will use illegal guns and put anybody's life at dan in danger. Will you sign an initiative 77 repeal bill? I will. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr.